Hello guys, it is Patrick here, Eggnot Poker. New video today, and we're going to be doing a theory video. Um, just a bit of a disclaimer, it is probably going to be quite a long video. I'm going to be trying to be doing between sort of 45 minutes and one hour in length. That is a long time. I appreciate that as a long time. This is not a um, Fast and Furious video. This is going to be getting the feet wet, getting our hands dirty, and getting involved in the theory. We're going to be focusing on the theory of sea betting in poker. Sea betting is such a massive topic. It's just huge. It's ridiculous. It can't be done in 10 minutes. If it can be done in 10, 15 minutes, then I wouldn't wouldn't recommend watching whatever it is you guys are watching. Sea betting is just monstrous, um, and we're not even focusing on all of it. We're mainly focusing on single rays, so ridiculous um and by the way no i'm not dead there was someone in discord that asked if i was dead i've been very busy i've also i've been doing obligations um outside of poker i've also been ill so you probably still um hear me up for the last couple of days i've basically just been in bed and ugh, not not great but anyway so just a quick shout out before we begin get all the shit out of the way as always uh, i just want to say a massive thank you as we always do and say to everybody that's liked, that's comment, that's been subscribing, that's been joining Discord, that's been joining the study groups, that's been submitting um, video reviews. Uh, disclaimer, there is another review that I'm going to be posting um, maybe a week after next, probably going to be a little while, um, which is for, um, it's either 10 or 25 Zoom, I can't remember, for another um, Discord viewer. Um, that will be getting uploaded. Um, I'm going to be doing a three-part series for this sea betting. So the next three days, we will be getting one video a day. Lucky you. And then after that, as very much promised, we will be doing a new video series or just a, another little sort of set of segments where we're going to be doing a video series for, um, I think I'll start on 10 and L and we'll do 10, 16, 25, 50 and 100 on Zoom. Um, one, between one and three videos per each take. We'll see how we go because I know people have been wanting those. We haven't done those for quite a while because we've been focusing on the micro stakes challenge. The micro stakes challenge, challenge has not come to a halt. It has not stopped. I um, haven't done any volume for about seven or eight days for that. And I will be mainly focusing on the theory sessions, the reviews, and the um, the sort of ad additional series of um, different stakes, uh, play and explains, up to uh, mid stakes. So they'll be fun. They'll be a bit different. And then we will sort of cycle back to the uh, to the mini uh, micro stakes mini series. We're on like sort of one one hundred five, one hundred seven, something like that on the bankroll, starting from fifty dollars. Um, so we're doing pretty well on that. Anyway, so. All that jargon out of the way then. So, sea betting. Sea betting's sea betting's an interesting one, personally. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the best at sea betting, but I'm 1,000 times better than I used to be. Christ, I would say sea betting was one of my biggest leaks. I, I think I used to just sea bet probably close to like 90, maybe 95% of the time. I would have absolutely no regard for what the board texture is. I'd completely just negate the fact that it's a single raise, a three bet, four bet, five bet pot, whatever. My board, villain's board, it doesn't matter. I would just AFK bet, see what happened, and then just did loads of check folding on turns. Not good, basically, not good at all. So what we're gonna do in this um, video is we, um, over three, um, well, between two and three videos, we are going to be going through um, all the different types of pieces of in information, all the fundamentals, all the things you guys need to be learning on um, C betting. So I'm just going to adjust the uh, the settings for this. Give me a second. Uh, let's make that a little bit smaller. There we go. So I can actually fit everything in. Uh, let's check that. There we go. Yes. So we're going to be going over all the fundamentals. Basically, you're going to be saying to yourself at the end of these videos, apart from, holy shit, that was way too much information this donk has given us. No idea what he's on about. We want to be looking at understanding ranges versus ranges versus ranges in all different positions. We want to be understanding the differences between single race, three bet, four bet, five bet pots, etc. We want to be understanding some of the fundamental reasons for C-betting, advantages and disadvantages of C-betting. We want to be learning why am I C-betting? What am I trying to accomplish? What am I what am I focusing on? What are my sort of mission parameters? What are my requirements? What are my thought processes for what I'm C-betting as a size? Like what's making me choose that size? What sort of range, um, what does my range of hands want to do? 
do in terms of sea betting percentage and frequency or the size, etc., etc., etc. There is so much information to go through with sea betting. We've already been going for nearly five minutes and I haven't even technically got to the first slide yet. That's how much I am babbling on. Um, so there you go, there's your five minute introduction and just a reminder that I am still alive, I am not dead. Um, I'm actually impressed that not many, uh, I don't think anyone at all is unsubscribed as I haven't re removed, um, haven't added any new content in the last sort of 13 days or something. So I do apologize for anyone who's been waiting, but I promise lots of good things are coming in the uh, next few days. So C betting then. So let's go to, let's just get straight into it, shall we? So C betting. Well, what is C betting? I suppose that's probably a slide I should have technically bet in. We, uh, put in. We know what C betting is. C betting technically is continuation betting, right? It doesn't have to be, um, I suppose it's derived from the old school theory of, you know, you, you raise, you C bet, and then we go from there, right? That's like the super old school logic. Well, C betting is actually extremely complex because C betting is, um, it's almost like a question in a way. You're like asking your opponent, do you want to continue? You're gaining information from betting you're putting your chips at risk by betting, you know, the sizes that you choose can bin yourself or bin your opponent. It, there's lots of factors that go into C betting. So what are the, first of all, what are the advantages of C betting? The way I'm gonna do this, cause I know I'm probably gonna spend a lot of time on these videos and I, pre warning, I appreciate this might take a long time. And there's probably some of you who are gonna be like, oh, this looks really interesting. Realize it's just gonna take hours and hours and hours to get through it. And then just go and the clock off. I appreciate that. Um, I did a study session, which I whizzed through in about an hour 20 with a bunch of people on my discord and that went really, really well. And uh, shout out to all those guys that were uh, put up with me. And I think um, I got a good review. I got pretty good feedback overall and everyone enjoyed it. But um, with these videos for YouTube specifically, I don't want to do quick snappy um, 15 minute video segments where, you know, I get all the clickbaits and you know, I actually just genuinely want these videos to just help people who are either whether, whether you're a struggling losing player, break-even player, a winning player, crusher at any level, this kind of theory is for everybody. Uh, there will be people, I, I would say it's probably more for inter intermediate to advanced players and strong winning players, not to sound entitled and just like kind of like shit on everyone who's not doing that well at the moment, but this is this is not going to be like a, a very beginner-friendly uh, kind of strategy guide, as it were. It's probably going to be quite complex. It's going to be quite GTFO. It's going to be quite advanced. But at the same time, I will try and dumb it down. But the way I'm going to be doing it is I'm going to be trying to ask you questions at home. And I want you to technically answer them for yourself before you kind of like listen to what I'm saying. Now, again, I'm not an all-seeing oracle. I am not some NL 50k death lot, death cyborg, okay? I, as I've always said, um, the, the highest stakes I've ever played are 100, uh, 50 and 100 in L. Most of my volume was at 50 in L zoom. Bunch of, um, within the last few months um, and also a bit of last year, um, some 100 zoom. Over a reasonable sample, I was winning. I wasn't a death crusher, but I was winning and improving and I'm still studying every day. So I'm not a complete charlatan, just uh, for anyone who's not sure. But in general, this information for the better part of it is fact checked. Uh, fact checked. It is through my own research. Uh, it is through my own studying. It is quite legitimate and it is quite useful and um, verified. So this isn't just some random bullshit. Okay, I promise you that. I wouldn't be saying anything on YouTube um, with any of my content that I um, I wasn't sure of. Okay. I am um, just just uh, as a disclaimer as well. There was um, I also did a little bit of extra research for this from uh, on YouTube myself for a few of the specific areas um, that I wanted to go through in a bit more detail. And I was trying to see if anyone had done anything. I want a quick shout out to DJ Wizard, who uh, I'm also an affiliate with, but they um, have their own um, sea betting strategy video, which is about 45 minutes to an hour in length, which is based off of what they did from... Um, uh, I'm trying to think, sorry, from what they did in one of their um, premium user guides, um, sort of play and explain, uh, talk through strategy session things. Um, and I took a few things from there. Um, obviously, I've changed the wording and put my own bits in them. I haven't just sort of copy and pasted. But some of the information I got um, was inspired from their PowerPoint. So I will put a description in the link below for them. Please check that out. It's really, really good as well. Uh, use it in conjunction with my own. Anyway, so then, what are the advantages of C-betting? 
think about them at home before you look at the next slide. Pause if you need to pause. Um, in my opinion, there are more than this. Some of these are more relevant than others. You may have, uh, you, you may know some ones that I've missed, okay? But just in general, um, what are the advantages of C-betting? So, first of all, we, uh, you can actually see my cursor, can't you? Yes, you can. Um, we get to keep control of the pot and represent strength throughout later streets. Now, this isn't a requirement, and this isn't really something that you should be looking to do every single time. However, um, just generally, and I suppose for the basic users, um, in poker and just generalize fresher players it is a good thing i suppose it can also be disadvantages uh dis disadvantageous but mostly sort of advantageous to just most of the time be continuation betting in a lot of situations especially at micro stakes where you just you, you're just saying you've got a good hand and you continuation bet and just make loads of people fold um, or just generate value from when you've got good hands. So just see betting in general um, as a very, very basic thing, very generalized statement to say. It does just give us control of the pot in most situations. But again, disclaimer, that will need to be refined um, at mid, mid stakes and high stakes. But uh, micro stakes and low stakes, you can get away with doing a lot of stuff that you shouldn't really do, but it is what it is. Um, obviously, we can generate value by betting. So say, for example, we raise an aces, the board's 7, 10, jack. We can get value from loads of worse hands like mid pairs, top pairs, open enders, draws, etc, etc, can't we? We are value betting. We're looking to get called by worse. So C betting, putting continuation betting is going to generate as value. Um, at the same time, if we are bluffing, so we've got, you know, we've got 4-5 um, on a 7-8, king board we've got a gut shot we've got five high you know we can maybe just make some hands like um some over like some middling rage cards that have got no equity to fold that are beating us for example that's always good you know it's, it's pretty self-explanatory isn't it you know we bet for value or we bet as a bluff to make people fold but um those are two of the main advantages of c betting and then finally we can also deny equity from villains uh, as well so as i've mentioned here in brackets uh, unable um Villains unable to see cards for free that can win later with bluffs or value bets later down the line. So, you know, again, pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? But denying equity uh, is actually a massive thing uh, overall across the board. Something we won't go into massive detail in today, but it is one of the factors of doing a lot of continuation betting and barreling and doing a lot of plays post-flop is to deny equity. That's you, you generate a lot of EV in your strategy by denying a villain from um, attaining or realisation of uh, his... Um, his hands on later streets. I'm trying to say things in the most uh, simple way possible and I feel like I'm doing the absolute opposite, so I do apologize. Um, moving on, so what, okay then, we've looked through some advantages, what are the disadvantages of c-betting? So again, just, just putting money in the pot is a good thing, but at the same time, it can put us into some difficult spots. So what, what, what are some of the disadvantages at home? Think about them and then have a look. So first of all, if we c-bet too much, we can become exploitable. Um, whether villains exploit us or not is irrelevant, but just generally we can become quite exploitable overall by um, just see betting blindly on all boards, all textures, all situations, all ranges, etc. Um, not thinking about sizes just yet, but just genuinely across the board. If you just sort of AFK bet every board and just don't really think about it, you're probably going to put yourself in quite a few tough situations. Um, not only because you're being exploited, but also just because you're going to put yourself in a, a couple of spots, which is just difficult to um to deal with basically so for example if you've got a board that isn't you your range doesn't interact with it very well but you're just sort of again afk betting for the sake of betting you know you get raised and you've had to overfold a hand that's no good or you know you just bet folding anything in general just kind of sucks um if you're just doing it willy-nilly willy -nilly, you um can put yourself in some uh, massive problems so let's have a look um Sorry, I do apologize. I'm getting spam text while I'm trying to do this. I'm going to ignore that and carry on. Um, there we go. So, And then on the flip side, if we uh, see bet, sorry, not enough of the time, so we don't see bet enough, we can also um, get ourselves into problems where um, villains can um, say, hey, look, he's see betting, say, like, only 20% of the time. I know that when he continuation bets, he's likely to be strong, so I can take advantage and overfold against see bets, for example. And then opposite to that with uh, if, if we're... Uh, c betting too much c, c betting can also potentially leave hero vulnerable to being attacked again kind of the same thing i suppose with um if we bet too much like villains are just going to say hey look you're c betting 80 percent of the time 90 percent of the time well 
you know, I can I can start raising you. Whether they do or not is another thing, but um, just generally that technically is a disadvantage to see bedding all the time um, without any sort of reason to. And then finally, um, just as generalization, if done right, sea betting is extremely powerful and sea betting is just a massive sort of continuation. It's kind of like the second part of the story, as it were, like you've done your pre-flop and now you get to the flop and now you continue this story, whether it's a bet, whether it's a check raise, whether it's a check fold, whatever. It's like the next stage of the story, uh, the storyline that you're you're taking with your hand and what you're representing um, in the way you play it. If you've done poorly, it can also become exploitable. You can be open to attack. And also, again, it's just... I think seabedding is something that's too generalized. I think a lot of people are like, oh, you either big bet or check here, or you know, or you, you, bet, you, you don't bet often here, but when you do bet, you bet big. The problem with seabetting, and I'm sorry, I know I blab, I know I babble on, and I talk and talk and talk and talk. And I know this is probably really difficult for a lot of people to continue watching, but just, just bear with me. You're gonna find if you study and if you really kind of want to understand the game, especially six max 100 BB strat, well, in any strat, I suppose, but just generally, um, every position plays differently against each position in a single raise, in three bet, four bet, five bet, multi-way, whatever, stack sizes, deep, 100, 150, 200. It all changes. The ranges change, the way the ranges play against each other change. It's not just, at the most basic level, you might say, yeah, okay, I, I probably want to bet this board quite often because it's it's probably hits my range quite well. Okay, that's like a basic level theory. But then as you start becoming more advanced, you start saying, well, yeah, that's true. So what's the size that I want to take? How often do I want to take it? Do I have multiple sizes? Do I want to simplify that strategy? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not something that you can just go, I know I bet small or check or I bet big or check because it, it varies a lot. And you're gonna have to look at lots of different scenarios to technically start really saying, I know I'm supposed to be doing this or that, and I'm doing it, like, why am I doing it? Rather than just sort of just saying, oh, I know that's big. You know, it, it's it's how far down the rabbit hole you truly want to go with your strategies, okay? And again, I'm not an oracle, and I make mistakes all the time, but I'm just saying, like, I'm getting better by just drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling and putting this information into my head, rather than just being like, oh, it's better third all the fucking time, okay? A third is a, is a trap, by the way. Even though it's a good size, it's a trap in a lot of spots. So, some generalized sea betting rules. Again, this isn't pretty. This isn't going to look really, really fun and user-friendly. This is just hard graft. This, this, this presentation for the next couple of hours, depending on how much of it you're watching in one go, is designed for people who really want to kind of learn the game, understand some of these really, really tough fundamentals. And by the way, this is also free, by the way. Just to say it out there, uh, to put it out there, I'm not charging for this. I'm not, you know, just saying I'm... I'm coaching with this. This is just free content. You don't have to watch this. But if you want to, it's really, really... I, I'm not saying I'm the best of all time because I'm not, but I'm just saying this is very, very good information for free, okay? And I'm also spending a lot of time explaining it. So, you know, I, I think this is pretty decent considering what um, some of the other stuff is out there and the fact that you have to pay for it. So here we go. So a couple of generalized rules then. Well, a couple. We actually got a lot, but um, generalized... Um, Overall, see better um, a general overall or a generalized overall see betting percent stat roughly looking about 65%, give or take. Now, again, this is subject to change in all positions, in all different um, situations, but generally, give or take a few percent, I would suggest roughly about two thirds of the time that you continuation bet in single raise pots. We're, we're mostly sort of focusing on single raise betting, um, continuation betting in this presentation we will do a small amount of three bedding um excuse me and a little bit of four bet bedding um pieces of info but we are primarily focusing on just sort of single raise um for the for, to start with okay but generally about two-thirds of the time if you start creeping into like 75 plus you start coming into the territory of you, you just see betting way too often it's not like a death mistake but if you're creeping up towards 80 you are quite exploitable at that point and again if you're see betting like across the board roughly sort of 25 30 percent of the time again you, you just it's just the the flip side uh to that exploitation you look like you're just not see betting very often you look like you're mainly waiting to to hit the board quite well or to just have a massive bluff do you see like you're just quite quite easy to to start um being to start playing um people 
can start exploiting you and play quite well against you. Sorry, is what I'm trying to say. Um, a factor that most people don't really appreciate is checking. It doesn't mean weakness, okay? Just because you continue, so you just say you raise pre in any position and you check the board, you know, unless it's like extremely good for you and you might bet range, but just generally, if you check the board, weak opponents automatically assume that's weakness. Like just a general thing because they're not they're not used to they're sheltered from from people who who play protected lines and have protected checks uh, and and do things in a certain way that is strategic and isn't just like oh just just bet the flop hundred percent and just hope they fold or hope they call when I've got it and then give up loads of turns or do you see like checking on any street but just today focused on c betting checking doesn't mean that you're giving up if you have a strategy in place. If you don't have a strategy in place and you're just saying, oh, I've missed this board, or, I, I don't know what to do, or I'm no good for me, or, I'll just check fold. You know, then it, then checking can be bad. And especially if you're doing it too often and, you, and when you check, it's always just weakness. It's really easy to, for even really bad people to play against you. It's just a fact. If, if you know that I'm C-betting only about 30% of the time and generally when I check flops or check turns, I give up, or maybe I bet nearly close to 100% of the time, but then I just give up on loads of turns. Do you see, like, you just you just make yourself extremely easy to play against. Even at micro stakes, people can can, can pick shit like that up pretty quickly. Um, at least some of the regs can, um, just across the board. Um, so checking is not weakness overall, um, as, part, as long as it's part of a, a correct strategy. It is a vital part of strategic play when protected by overall strategy. Check fold, check call, check raise. Like, it doesn't just... We don't just mean check fold when we check all right so it's something to think about um generally and this is something we will touch a little bit later down the line probably like segment two or three is when we're focusing on some of the board textures but just as a generalization um when we thinking about bet sizing we generally go quite small um like sort of 10 percent 30 percent when the boards uh, this is generally when the boards are very wet so very very dynamic yeah so like monotone boards for example like really really heavily like connected boards like seven eight nine and some flush draws etc and so on like especially the sort of low to mid end um but again disclaimer it's 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 range versus range under the guns range versus big blind defense compared to a button open or a small blind open versus big blind defense you know on a monotone board like again we're going to focus on this in more detail later okay so this don't worry but the range under the gun versus the range on the button versus the range on the small blind are all very different compared to the big blind defense yeah so it's it's a case of like who's like if the board's ace king two or ace king five or whatever utg can overbet but they generally like going small and they can mix a lot of sizes. But as you start going around the board, the button and the small blind, for example, have massively wider ranges than the UTG does when they open. So they don't get to just bet small 100% of the time. You see, like they actually start becoming quite polar and really go bigger or check to protect all the hands in, in between. That's why they go quite small. Monotone textures, you generally go quite small because you just don't want to do it in. You don't have enough hands that just want to go big. You Even if even the good hands don't technically want to go big because they want to just, they want to protect all the other hands in their range. It's kind of like a game of like, it's, think of like Game of Thrones, but like game of sticks. Who's got the biggest stick? Who's got the nut edge, right? But then also in terms of like, how long is your stick and how sturdy is that stick, right? How relevant, like how many hands in your range um, are relevant to the board texture versus villain? Just because you have more over pairs, that's fuck all versus your opponent having more straights and two pairs and sets and flushes, for example. You see, a lot of people tend to just go, oh, I've got way more like aces and kings here, so I just get to do whatever I want. Whereas, no, that's not the case, you know? So, hopefully, from this presentation as an overall standpoint, you will start to appreciate some more of the whys and um in, in c betting rather than just like the what's i think a lot of uh, a lot of content out there is just like oh you just bet small often or you just bet big or check and that's it like there's nothing else in between and there's so much there's just ridiculous amounts that go into c betting from all different types of positions uh, it's it's just astronomical and how much how much information there is but the more you take in guys and learn it properly the better it is for yourself trying to apply it like i know like a lot of you are going to get like through this video and you're just going to be like this guy just talks a lot and it's hard 
to process it and it gets boring. I appreciate that. I do. But like for free content, educational content, like I am really trying to help you guys push for learnings, um, deeper strategy. Um, and I enjoy it and I feel like I myself hopefully like apply this better by trying to sort of tell other people to implement it as well. Okay, so... Anyway, moving on. So yeah, very small when the board is generally quite wet, just because we just want to, we, we just don't want to do it in. We just want to continue with a small sizing and then get to turns and rivers. We don't want to do it in, but um, we don't have enough hands that absolutely want to death nuke. Like we just make villains play really well when we go really huge. It's just really, really easy to play when we just start off with small sizings so on these really wet textures. Okay, when this when the, when, the, when the boards are. Um, a bit more dry it says like you know king seven or more like like eight more like more so the asex just generally but um across the board when the boards are slightly slightly drier you do start favoring more of these sort of smaller to medium mix sizes with some other bigger ones as well but generally sort of small to medium um and then as the and then as the um excuse me when the um i'm trying to think of this off the top of my head without sort of saying it in a really really complicated way all i'm gonna do is i'm just gonna use this as a reference as one of these later slides is just here where it's like again dry texture we bet a little bit smaller the wetter the texture we start raising some um generalized anyway we start generally starting to increase some of the sizes and then when we get to these super wet textures we then go back down to a small size we're going to go into more detail with this later on because we're just going through generalizations but yeah i, I just maybe that image um, I should have had on two slides just to use as a bit of a reference. Okay. Um, in terms of very big sizings, so in terms of like overbetting, again, this is these are generalizations, right? We will go into some specifics later on. Okay, but you will find in GTO especially is you do do quite a decent amount of overbetting not as much on flops but you, you definitely do do it on flops but there's a lot of turnover betting and river over betting but generally in terms of c betting and single raise pots it's a lot of like extreme polarization with range so what that means is the best way of saying it is if i open um on the button okay and the big blind defense yeah let's um what i'll do is i'll um bring up my trusty holdem thing uh where are you Video capture. No, I want Windows capture. Yes, please. Let's change to this. Uh, 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 uh. I'm just going to drag this in. So, for example, um, let's just say um, the button opens. It, do it doesn't matter what you've got. We've just got any two cards. And the um, big blind defense, they've got any two cards. And the board is something like ace, king, five. Uh, let's just go with rainbow just to make it nice and simple um big blind checks so won't be doing any leading and here we are on the button okay so just as a thing like in different positions like under the gun mp button small blind your strategy changes and is more mixed um the wider you go or the later you go around the table for example so in terms of like over betting right if i was um on the button here my range is quite wide on the button right i'm playing quite a lot of hands i'm opening like my queen five suited my queen three suited i'm opening like jack nine off etc 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 because i'm opening so many hands i don't just get to say oh i've got more aces kings and ace king here so I just get to bet small 100% of the time, and that's what I do. Well, technically, no, actually. You know, there is some smaller betting, but your range actually technically wants to check or mainly over bet because you are so polarized. Like, you don't want to just bet here all the time of, like, sevens, king, queen, nine, ten, so, like, jacks, ten, like, five, six. I'm just thinking of loads of hands in range, right? There's just so many hands that just... They don't really want to bet this very often. And the hands that do want to bet are so nutted or bluff heavy that you and you have so many hands in between, right? You don't just you have to be careful and kind of think about protecting all of these sort of like your children in between. Think of it like having an adult at the front 
um, and an adult at the back, and then all of these children in the middle, like a kind of uh, in a line waiting to um, cross the road, right? Something like that. That's probably the way I would think about it. You kind of have to say, look, if I just bet my whole range for small, technically the big blind, well, okay, we're thinking theoretically, right? You know, good opponents and so on. But technically a good opponent can just realize that if you're just betting a third 100% of the time, or you're just betting small all the time here, it doesn't have to be exploitation, but just generally, like, technically, just mathematically, it's just awful, really, to just do that. Because you just don't have enough hands that want to do that. You, you just don't. You, you, your range is overflowing with hands that just cannot defend and do not want to keep barreling and just, like, check back turns and then leave your range hanging out of its arsehole in the river to get bluffed on or value bet. Do you see? It's tough. So your range mostly wants to bet massive or check. Whereas if I... Switch, uh, switched up and I wasn't on the button anymore, I'm now under the gun, okay? And I've got any two cards that I open under the gun, all right, with a correct sort of generalized opening range. Now, it becomes a, ca a, a case of like, because your range is so much more condensed under the gun compared to like being the bastard or the small blind, now you, you generally do go quite small. You, you still have like mix sizings, you can still do some like sort of middling to large sizes. You, I suppose you could still theoretically overbet, but you would, you would do way more um, of all sizes, including check, but mostly sort of betting small, because you just you don't you don't have to sell this story that you're you're basically protecting protecting loads of hands anymore. Now it just it just comes down to like, I've got loads of the knighted hands. Big blind doesn't have um, ace king very often. Technically, they don't have kings or aces at all. Um, big blind's best hand here, apart from like ace five king is is what's well, ace five, king five, and pocket fives, and at low frequency ace king, and they also have a wider range. Whereas UTG is just a strong, condensed, fixed range with a nut edge with a strong range advantage, like like generally, and, and just is just doing well. So they don't have to overbet. They don't have to just bet large all the time. Do you see? Like they can do what they want more. Whereas when you get round to the button. You have to sell the story a bit harder. I like to use an analogy where you're saying, like, under the gun here with a condensed range, I'm actually, like, selling old-fashioned, out-of-the-bottle Coca-Cola, right? That That, that is just full of death sugar but it's beautiful it tastes amazing super expensive whatever but then you get to the button now you're selling sort of pepsi max out of a can and you've really got to fucking sell it do you see what i'm saying like the the range like your nut edge will be the same but your range is different right and the the, the way you sell your range and interact with your range against your villain your villain's range determines what your your sizing is and your frequency um in terms of your betting patterns, right? <laughs> it's, this, this is where it starts getting quite complicated, and I wanna, I'm trying to find a way to make this quite simple. But the positions that you're here, that you get here with, dictate your action, rather than just saying, oh, I know on Ace-King-5 I do this. Oh, well, what do you do on Ace-King-5 UTG versus Big Blind? What do you do UTG versus Button Flat? What do you do um, in a Small Blind versus a Big Blind Flat? Do you see, like, the board, it's, it's, it's not just, oh, this is what I do on Ace King 5. It's what does position X do versus position Y in this particular sp specific spot, whether it's a single raise, a three bet, and so on and so on and so on and so on. You just add all the variables up and then you start um, deciphering what you want to do. So this is like just as a generalization, right? I'm just talking about how things change. Like we're going to look through board textures. We're going to go through C-bet sizes. We're going to discuss in depth this nut advantage versus range advantage. We're going to go through all of this. This is why I am making these longer videos so we can go through all this information. Okay, like this is not going to be easy. I appreciate this is probably going to be quite difficult to um, to keep up with me, depending on your ability level. But uh, that sounds really entitled. But you see what I'm saying? Like it's not easy. It's really, really not easy to. Um, to go through this, so well done um, if you, if you have made it this if this far. Um. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to wet my whistle. Oh, so oh, I've had a really sore throat last couple of days, so my eyes are watering. That's why I'm uh, crying. <clears throat> um, right, sorry, I'm just going through this. 
Right, then what's next? Um, so that's over betting as a generalization. So next is betting bigger versus betting smaller um, generally. Okay, so in terms of C betting, I think a lot of the time people get into this um, this way of thinking where I suppose it's mainly ignorance without sounding nasty, but like people just say to themselves, especially when they don't know what to do or they are misapplying or just not sure, just in general, people will generally say to themselves, whether it's a single raise, a three bet pot, whatever, people kind of just bet small often, right? And they know it works often, but they don't really, they don't really know why and they don't really know what they're trying to accomplish or what they're targeting that well. They just kind of bet small often because it's just easy and it, you know you don't risk as much money and you probably don't get punished at a lot of stakes where you're supposed to. That's fair enough. But um, there is actually quite uh, a big science towards betting small versus betting big. Okay, so when do we bet big in general when it comes to C betting? Okay, um, so what we want to think about is when we think about betting um, to bet big or bet small, when your villains have fewer, okay, they have less nutted hands um, that can make your value range indifferent. That's when you can bet bigger generally. So what does that mean? So basically, um, if your villain, okay, has a lot of, like, interacts with the board quite well, let's say the big blind defends versus uh, the hijack, right? The, the board comes four, five, six, okay? Or three, four, five, whatever. The big blind's going to have a lot of really nutted hands and a lot of the best hands, right? Like straights and sets and two pairs and whatnot, right? Okay, and potentially flushes on mono boards, whatever that the you know the hijack doesn't have you don't get to, to to now like the big blind checks to you and, and then here we are as the hijack for example no leading we're just we're just, we're just all donking we'll just keep it simple you, you don't again this is a spot like you don't get to really just bet really 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 big like start over betting you don't just go huh i don't bet here often so i'll over bet this four five six versus the big blind hell no the big blind smashes this board if you have aces Right, you don't want to start overbetting four, five, six against the big blind. Why? Because you just don't like the, the big blind's got a philanthropy of all the best hands that you don't even have that much to tell you the truth anyway. But you actually just check back a shit ton and start betting smaller, yeah, small to medium sizes, mainly small, just generally because you just you just don't get to bet big. Like, you, your villain's range is hitting the board too hard, and especially with the best hands. So you generally would bet smaller or check as a main strategy, right? Okay. In terms of being made indifferent, it basically means if your villain's got, like, a big, the big fucking stick here and you start sledging all the time, you know, then it basically means he gets to bluff you a lot, but, well, in theory, because his range is just so much stronger than yours, right? And also, the times he's value betting against you, he just gets to smash you up. So, he basically, it, being made indifferent is kind of like, he's like, he's pushing his edge against you, and he's pushing up to the wall, and you can't theoretically or mathematically defend against it very well. So he's basically putting you in spots where you're sort of folding out equity a lot. He's denying equity from you. He's um, get, He's got situations where he's got the same types of hands as against you, but and he's leveraging a lot of fold equity and then at times he's value betting. You, do you see what I'm saying? Like he's putting pressure on you and he's forcing folds and he's gaining a lot of um, value from these hands. And when you bet big, you just allow him to play really well and you get him, you kind of force him to, to, to outplay you even by accident, okay? So you have to be careful. Whereas when we were like, you know, on the on like Ace King Five, you know, and you're on the button, or the UTG, you can overbet either, but you prioritize overbetting in the late positions because of, just because you have rain. Like yeah, you have these nutted hands more than your villain, but it it it's like oh my nut edge is strong, but how how wide is this range underneath it, right? That we you know how hard do we need to sell this story, overbetting versus betting small? Do you see? Whereas on Ace King Two or Ace King Five, the big blind just cannot defend versus overbets very well. That's why you know the, the hands they continue with, you get a lot of value from, or you get shitloads of fold equity versus a lot of other hands. You see, like massive pressure for um, as bluffs, massive value when you have it and you want to get called. That's that's what you want to do technically, and you can't get binned. Like it's really hard to get binned. If you start if you overbet Ace King Five, big blind just doesn't get to start sledging against you 
whether they have it or not. You see, it's really tough. Really, really tough to play against, and uh, it's really, really good long term. Carrying on. So, we're also betting bigger when Villain has many hands with decent equity against top of range. So, this kind of comes under the same same thing to some extent. So, it's like, again, we were thinking about a game, you know, they don't, like when the Villain's range has a lot of nutted hands, you don't get to overbet. Um, but when they do, like, w when they don't have as many of these strongest hands, that's when you start to get, start betting bigger, right? But also, when your villain just hits the board really hard, again, the big blind is just a really good example, and the board's like four, five, six, again, versus the hijack, we'll take the same example. The big blind just hits this more than you. He's got more, stra uh, more straights, he's got more sets, he's got more two pairs. Like, his range of hands that he plays, he's got more, like, six X and so on, whatever. He, his range interacts with the board so often that you know your best hands because it's so few compared to the amount of really really good hands that he's got you know like again you don't get to bet big against him because his not only his nut is his not his nut range is in there and better than yours but his range just overall interacts with the board more than yours does so again he's got a bigger he's got a stronger stick and a bigger stick, right? It's no good. So you cannot start going big against it. You have to go small, technically, okay? If it was the other way around, like, again, that's what the bank small is for. Like, you only bet big when you've got the big, when you've got the, all the best hands, you've got the nutted hands, your range interacts with the board well, that's when you can bet smaller. Uh, sorry, th th that's when you can bet really big. For example, you can bet large, you can overbet, etc. When you're, it's kind of like a, a, a game of respect. It's like being a samurai in a way. Like you respect your villain. You don't just go Ooh, fucking dick swinging and s fucking windmilling and all the no. It's not like that. <laughs> you respect your enemy. If your enemy has the advantage, you don't press the attack. You pull back. And you allow him to do what he's doing, but you 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 go on damage limitation, you go on protection, you go on respect, and you start tiptoeing. When you have the fucking edge, that's when you push. That's when you start bluffing heavy. That's when you start value betting heavy. But it's kind of like a game of respect, not just fucking windmilling and dick swinging. Okay, the game is not just bet bet shove, bet bet shove, bet bet shove. It, it is to some you know in some areas, but most of the time it's more just about controlled aggression. You have power here. Use your power. You don't have power here. Your villain does. You must respect it. Okay? If your villain has all the best hands and a lot more of them, you generally don't bet big. You bet smaller in check. Okay? It's generalized because there are a lot of different situations. But okay? But just don't fucking start sledging when your villain's got the edge. Okay? Another example is like you open on the button. Let's, um, I've got a really, really good example here. Is um, let's, let's put some in... Um, Sorry, let me just uh, change this up. So let's clear this. So for example, uh, let's say what we open, um, let's go with under the gun. We've got any two under the gun. Let's go with the big blind defense. And again, any two in a big blind defense range. The board comes four, five, six, I suppose. There you go. Like, let's say the big blind doesn't donk. Let's keep it simple. Here we are in the UTG. We don't technically open fours or fives a whole bunch. We don't open four, five or five, six a whole bunch. We don't open seven, eight a full frequency. We don't open two, three. We don't really hit this board very well. We hit it with like most of the time. We're like, we can have sixes quite often, right? But then we have like hands like sevens, eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens, kings, aces, whatever. But then we have loads of ace X. We have loads of king X, queen X, jack X, king five, like nine, like jack ten suited, you see. Whereas the big blind has lots of hands as well, but then he has loads of like four, five suited pure. He has like five, six, he has like seven, eight. He, you know, do you see, I don't think he has a deuce tray, but he hits the board often and heavy and his top end is stronger than our top end. So we really just check back a lot and we generally bet smaller. We don't go, oh, I check, I check or bet big because yeah, you, you're right, you don't bet often, but that doesn't, just because you don't bet often doesn't entitle you to betting big. You might not bet often, but bet small. Do you see? This is where the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper and deeper, the more positions and the more situations you find yourself in. It's not just a fucking, oh, this is one thing, I'm not going to say the name of this, okay, but there is a training site that goes, oh, you, you, you do one of two things when you start see betting. You either bet small and consistently, or you check and bet really big, and you don't bet often. Well, yeah, but it's not just, that's way too generalized. You might check 
pure. You might bet pure. You might check and bet small. You might check and bet big. You might check and over bet. You might have multiple sides. Do you see? Like, it all varies based on positional. Like, who's got the nut end? Who's got the overall range advantage? What um, are we multi-way? How deep are we? Um, positional edge. Do, do you see? Like, you, it's loads of different um, areas to think about when you're um, thinking about CBSA. Okay, not just fucking windmill and just bet small 100% of the time and whatnot. Like, there is so much that goes into it. Okay, right. So let's switch this back to the document and we will carry on. Um, right. So we're also betting bigger when um, the value of fold equity is high. So this is quite this is quite a generalized one again. But for example, like if you're very low in your range. And you know that um, the board is good for you. Like, yeah, you can bet small sometimes as well, but but you're able to bet big. So, for example, you might take quite a polarized strategy and just say, look, I know, like, my range can do, like, multiple sizes, but I'm very low in my range, and I know the villain's going to have a, a tough time fighting. If you want to, you can bet small often, or you can bet really big. You might choose, like, the board's like ace, king, queen. You've got pocket fours. You might overbet that if you want to, or you might bet big, because you, or you've got, like, five, six suited. You might bet big if you want to, because you can put a lot of pressure on loads of hands. Whereas if you bet small, you know, again, this is something you can do either or. There isn't a right or wrong. It's frequency, but you can bet little and often, and against the weakest part of villain's range that, you know, he, you'll make it fold. But against lots of hands, they will continue versus the small sides. Whereas if you bluff bottom of range for a large size on the flop, large size over bet, whatever, that will attain more fold equity versus like the, the weaker parts of villain's range that may have floated or, you know, continued versus a small size. Do you see? But the value of fold equity, it's not just being biased because you've got bottom of range. It's about pushing, you know, the, your, your nut and range advantages on a lot of board textures where, where villains can't um, continue. So the value of just getting a fold because we're bottom of range effectively most of the time is, is really good, okay? If you've got a scenario where you just bet small with range, you just bet small with range, but a lot of spots where you've got multiple sizes because you, you, you can do whatever you want, for example, or you're just going over bet and check, genuinely over betting or betting larger with the weaker parts of your range in those scenarios where, you, where you're able to is the best thing to do because you want the fold equity. You want a fold. You've, you've got nothing, you see? Um... Also, we can bet big when Hero has plenty of super strong hands in range. So again, this is kind of like a an extreme version of um, the, the, the first sort of one or two points. If we've got all the knighted hands and villain doesn't, so for example, let's just say we've got more over pairs and over pair, like the board's like, I don't know, like king, queen, five, for example, you know, if you want, or like ace, king, four or whatever. If you've got more of these knighted hands and you're able to, you know, and you want to over bet and you think you can, then you can do it because you you know you you have all of these strongest hands on ace king five the big blind cannot like it really struggles to play against, to play well against you when you start over betting it's really really tough for them to play um, because they just don't have ace king they don't have aces they don't have kings a whole bunch right so it, in in a single raise so you're able to over bet whereas if the board's four five six against UTG you don't get to over bet okay and then finally we can bet big when hero has uh, fewer middling middling hands in range to protect so basically this means um so our range doesn't fall apart if we have a lot of middling hands excuse me that want to check then we don't just get to bet small and often so this comes back to like where i was sort of criticizing this previous story you know the previous site where they were saying oh no you know you bet you can just bet small range or you bet you know or you check and bet big some of the time right generally like the more hats so basically the, the, the kind of way to think about it is the more if you're range so like the utg versus big blind analogy if you're under the gun right you can just bet small and often a more 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 often um than not because you have a small condensed range you don't have all these hands in between that have missed as much on a lot of textures that's why you know you can over bet but you just generally bet smaller on a lot of like really good textures for you like king queen 5 ace queen 6 king king 2 whatever because you know you can just bet small and often because you have a small condensed range you have a nut and range advantage and that's what you do why risk more you don't have to in this spot whereas the button or the small blind versus the big blind defense they have to have a there's a harder sell and they've also got a wider range in between right so they have to um it's basically like how many of these hands are in your range that you have to be careful of, right? 
like the button can't just bet small with range a lot of the time on a lot of these polarized textures like ace king five for example because you know they've got loads of hands that don't want to bet they want to check so you just, your range kind of falls apart if you don't um, follow it properly okay so and i moving forward we're going to do one one or two more slides before we finish for um, segment one just to very very quickly evaluate so we went through some of these advantages we went through disadvantages we've gone through some of the generalized rules um when thinking about betting and we've gone through when to bet bigger overall so we're going to finish with when to bet small which is the same but uh, complete opposite i suppose for a paradox the same rules apply but they are flipped over to the opposite so for example we now bet smaller Right, I'm not going to repeat myself, but I'm just going to go over these. We now bet smaller when villain has a lot of nutted hands, as we said. Um, so it's, it's the other way around, right? So we can bet small when the villain's got most of these nutted hands. We don't want to bet big and do it in a lot of the time. When villains, um, we bet small when villain has um, few hands with decent equity against heroes top of range. So you basically just say, look, the, the, the villain doesn't doesn't have loads of big hands here compared to us. His range isn't as strong as ours. So we can just bet little and often. It's not because we're scared, but it's just because we don't have to risk as much. We can just bet a really small amount and then build a strategy from there rather than just betting big all the time, you see? Um, we can bet small um, when the value of fold equity isn't as high. So, for example, again, you've, you've got a really, really good hand or you've got an advantage, advantageous board. You just want to bet small most of the time, right? Again, disclaimer, you can bet bigger on a lot of these textures, but just generally it comes down to um, who's got the best hand, like who's got who's got the nutted hands? Who's got like a who's, who's range interacts with the board more often, um, and then just go from there. Okay, uh, it, it's tough. It is tough because like I know a lot of people are going to look at these slides, especially these two, and they're going to go right. I know I can bet big because, and they're going to start looking through these bullet points, and it's just going to go right past their head. It's just as I've said already about four or five times. If the villain has got loads of really good fucking hands and you don't. You don't get to bet big, okay? And at the same time, if the boards are really good for your range, you generally just bet smaller, okay? But the later you are in position in the positions, the more like the harder it is to sell some of these these board textures. So like these nutted board textures, right? On a dry A75, you can just bet third with a lot of your range most of the time in a lot of positions. Because you know, you just the opener like really like the aggressors really favor these asex boards because you open all the strong suited asex and a lot of the offsuit asex and a lot of positions and you just get to bit small and it, that's how that's what you do with a lot of hands but when the boards become really tough like ace king five you know like and you're in late position you just have so many hands you have like queen seven suited well that's completely missed this ace king five you got pocket nines that doesn't really kind of want to bet you see so that's the way to think about it um the last few points here with betting small are the same as big, but they're op the opposites, okay? So it's just repeating myself, basically. So I've what I've done here in terms of a study tool is um, I've highlighted in red here the key words that kind of describe when to bet small and when to bet big, okay? Like, I've already said it a couple of times. I'm not going to say it again, right? This is for your, uh, for you guys at home, okay? But... These red word, these these um, highlighted words here are the prior are the sort of the primary part of these uh, two slides for when to bet big and when to bet small. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause it there. And we're going to move over to part two, and then we're going to move into um, some of the sea betting um, sort of examples, and then we're going to look through different sizes, for example, and then we're going to go into a bit more detail um, with board textures and nut and range advantage and how to sort of dev um, to how they dictate a lot of action okay so i'll see you in part two